Thank you. Good morning. Uh, we will start. Um, I do note the existence of a quorum. Um, so please, if we can let our minutes reflect the names of the members who are present with us this morning, that would be great. Um, the agenda. Does anybody have the, the draft agenda was circulated last week? Does anybody have any proposed changes to the draft agenda? I have a motion to adopt it. Move to adopt. Second. Second. Okay. I don't hear any opposition. We will consider the agenda adopted by unanimous consent. Um, approval of the minutes of the February 14 meeting. Uh, that was previously circulated. Um, does anybody have any proposed changes? Move to accept. Motion to accept. I have a second. second. Okay. We don't hear any opposition. So not hearing that, we will consider the uh, minutes of the previous meeting of February 14th uh, adopted by unanimous consent. Um, first item on our agenda is um, the listening session that we held on March 6th. I thank those of you who participated and the staff who took the time to work with us on that. Um, this would be an appropriate time if folks want to have discussion or have any comments on a listening session or any takeaways. I think it's a good time for folks to raise that. We had relatively minor participation. I'd say it's always disappointing when you have sessions like that and you only have three people um, sign up to talk. But um, this would be a time to talk about it if you want to. Well, personally, hey, I thought it was very helpful. Um, um, I found it interesting. Um, the, the people who um, take the time to come and uh, give very thoughtful comments certainly helped it. Um, I didn't hear anything persuade me one way or the other, obviously, um, but I, I thought it was very helpful to hear from them. David, did, did I see your hand raised? No. no. Anybody else want to have any, have any comments or any further discussion on the public sessions? Okay, thank you. We will move on to the next item of business on our agenda, which is establishing, this morning we're scheduled to establish our majority positions and recommendations. Um, we could start with group one, um, which is we have labeled as voter direct election of the council president and term of the council president. Um, I've scheduled this for about 15 or so minutes. Um, I think we have time. I know we've discussed this over several different meetings. I don't know whether or not folks have a desire to have any further discussion. This will sort of be time to sort of speak or forever hold your peace before we vote. Um, uh, so is there anybody who wants to make any further comments, persuade anybody, change somebody's mind? This this would be the chance. Well, I guess... Uh comment on my concern is that it tips the balance uh, and, and uh, if you have an executive I think that uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that it serves a useful purpose to have direct election of a council president because I think that uh, it's unnecessary and I think the system is, works well as, as is presently functioning. The fact that we've had so few witnesses and comments, I think, indicates a high degree of satisfaction uh, with uh, the county and its uh, governance. And uh, there was uh, an age old struggle between every executive and every legislative branch. And being in the same party uh, doesn't change that at all. Uh, but I think as long as uh, we have uh, the county executive, the voters uh, supported the referendum that was necessary to create the position of county executive, uh, I do not believe that we need a uh, direct election of a uh, council president. Uh, and uh, I just don't believe that the, uh, the case has, uh, has been made as to why we, we should have direct election of council president. I, I agree with that. I, I'm somewhat persuaded that um, 
having a council president serve more than one year is probably a good idea. I, I my, personally, my sweet spot it seems is like a two year period. The first year getting up to speed and then having um, um, you know an agenda that they can um, pursue for the for the second year. Um, however, uh, I don't think a charter change is necessarily required. Um, Um, does it, does, is there any discussion folks want to have about whether or not the two years is an appropriate term or some other period is an appropriate term? Currently, we're using one year. Does folks want to discuss that or debate that at all? Hey, Jim, this is Jeff. I'm on I'm on my phone for, for a bit here. Okay. Well, Can you hear me? Yep, I hear you perfectly. We're in a different room with great sound. Oh. <laughs> Good. Um, I'll be I'll be on video when I get back to the house. Right now, I'm driving. Um, I believe that we should be two year term and I believe it should go in the charter so that it doesn't get messed with every two years. Um, that's my, I don't think it needs to be a, a direct election, just appointed, but I think for a two year term. So that's where I, that's where I am at on this. All right, so. This is CC. I did all that. Um, I just think that two years is like a really sweet spot. Um, it's long enough for um, folks to advance their agenda. It's long enough to have some kind of consistency. Uh, I think making it the change at the charter level um, also gives some kind of, I don't know if legality is the right word, um, you know, but just that this decision is being made thoughtfully and intentionally. Um, but yeah, I also don't agree with the direct elections either. Um, I think the council president continuing to be appointed by their peers for a two-year term is is the sweet spot. All right. If I could uh, chime in. Sure. Um, I think that there's no reason for us to try to present this as a charter amendment to voters that if the council can make the change and just decide to start to have two-year terms for the president that they should do it and uh and not the, it's just not something that i think that the is easy to explain to uh to voters or needs to be presented to voters the council can do it on their own and they should do it if they think it's uh, beneficial to the operation of the council. Up to this point, they have not. Uh, every, in essence, four members of the council get a turn. I don't know that there's a need for the, the charter to be amended. I don't agree. All right, so what I'm hearing is perhaps we could structure this as three independent questions. Um, the first question, and we'll, we'll ask each question and take a vote on each separately, we could do that, which is be, the first question would be, sh should we have a direct election of the council president? The second question would be, should we propose that there be a two year term instead of the current one year? And then the third question would be uh, what David suggested, which is, should it, it, that if we change the term from, from one year to two, whether it should be a charter change or just a matter left to the discretion of the council by rule. Does that make sense to have those three questions? Are there, are there, is there a fourth question anybody wants to ask? Yeah, uh, a point of question or point of order or whatever, whatever the problem. Um, if we were to make a charter change um, for, the pre for the president of the council, what, which charter section would it be in? Maybe there's some more research that would be required, but would it be section 105 or section 108? This is a question for staff. I know you probably don't have any lives. I, with regard to the specific section, I think I have to get back because we get back to you because we have it both in the charter and in the code. Right. And in the code, it provides for the rules. So um, wh why don't I get back to you? And... 
okay. on what the exact section. Um, I think section 108 is the, is the only section that talks about council president. So I would suggest that, but I think that we could decide that that's a matter of up to the council. If we could, if okay, we're going to place it or, you know, I guess we could decide whether that's something we really feel this commission needs to weigh in on. Okay. Does that impact is that something you feel you is that does that impact some of the questions one of the questions? I, I guess I frame I frame the question as whether or not we believe changing to a two-year term is, is something that belongs in the charter, something that should just remain as a council rule. Okay. And we'll leave leave the section out of the, that question. That, that would be my suggestion, but it's it's up, it's up to how strongly everybody else feels. Okay. I guess I guess I would say, uh, I mean, we heard from two current council people about this, and it seemed like for them it was an important thing. But I guess we're not certain whether or not the council as a whole really desires to do this. So I don't know where that that leaves us, but it, it, it might suggest that it would be better for the council to do this, and whether or not it needed to be codified and. In, in the charter well that, the council would have to it would, it would be require an action of the council in all three possible circumstances whether it's by rule by changing the county code or by changing the charter the council would have to act by majority okay, vote okay. in all three cases okay yeah. okay um so, so i think i if i don't see any other hands i think we're ready to vote um Couple ways we can do this. We could do this by raising a hands, but that's not going to work for you folks on the screen who have still pictures and I can't see hands. So, how about if I I call names for the folks who are on the screen, and we'll see if we can raise hands in this room to, to make it go quickly. Um, on the screen, I see uh, David first up in my upper left hand here on the question of electing the council president. How say you, David? Yeah, your name. He's got a thumb down. We'll, we'll record that as a no. Cece? Nay. Nay. Dylan? Nay. Okay, Jeffrey? Nay. Nay, okay. Nay. Nay. Okay, Marcella? Marcella, you're on mute. You can unmute yourself. I can't tell if she can hear me or not. So for the time being, we're going to go in the room. Do we have anybody here? Why don't we show, show hands if you would be in favor of electing the council president? We have no hands in this room for that. So we are all nay. Marcella? Can you hear me? All right, let's see if she check back with her later. Okay. Well, you have a clear um, majority. Yes, no, we have a clear majority. I just did what reporters would if I could just say her name is on the screen. Okay. Uh, on the proposal that the council presidency be a two year term, um, David? Nay. Jeffrey? Yeah. Sorry, Jim. This is a. This is, the the question on the table is whether the two year term should be written into the charter. Is that no, the question, the question on the is table? Just, the question is strictly whether or not you would recommend that the council presidency be a two year term, and then we will get to a third separate question as to the method by achieving that, whether it's charter or not charter. This is just so purely. If on it, the... uh, Jim, if it isn't um, a charter measure, it's none of our business. There's no reason for us to vote on something that isn't anything to do with the charter. Uh, that's true. Strictly speaking, uh, as an advisory body, I think we have the discretion to say it's our advice you do it, whether you do it in the charter or not. I, I agree with you, definitely. Uh, okay. Fair. You're the chair. Okay. So they tell me. Okay. <laughs> uh, where Jeffrey, you vote on the two year term? Yes. Yes. CC. Yes. Yes. Okay. 
Uh, who else is on screen? Marcella again. Marcella, you're on mute. Okay, David. To your term. No. Okay. okay. Sorry. Yes. Yes. To to your term. I'm sorry. I didn't hear. I couldn't catch you. You were muffled a little bit. Yes. Yes. To the two year term. And how did you vote on electing the president? Um, by the peers. Sorry, I can't. I you're. I'm having some trouble picking. By, by the peers. Yes, by the peers. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You should clarify the question was direct elections of the president. I don't think she knows what she's saying yes or no to. Uh, just to clarify, Martha, the question was whether or not you favor a recommendation to have direct election by the voters of the president. And you said by the peers. I, I take, we're taking that as an, if that's a no vote to direct election. I'm sorry, I had trouble hearing earlier, but um, in my group, we discussed that uh, we feel like we need to come up with a recommendation for the for the commission to do that, not the voters, uh, because two of the of the members came to us with that issue. So obviously, they knew they could do it themselves, and they felt that they had to come to us to get it done. So, and the the election of the president by by their by the peers. Uh, I don't know if we're at that stage yet. I'm sorry, I, I had issues with the audio earlier. I tried to log in twice. I think he's just recording yes or no votes. Um, oh, I, I apologize. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. You were you cut out on the last words. I said so, I apologize, sorry. So Marcella, are you, are you in favor or opposed to direct elections of the of the president, opposed. Thank you. Uh, in the room on on the two year term, favoring a two year term instead of the current one year term. Marvin, yes, yes. Michael, no, <clears throat> yes, that's you. Yes, yes. Howard, I'm sorry, I have to make sure I understand. Sure. But are we voting on? Whether or not the council should. We're voting on whether or not we think it would be better to have two years. We will next vote on on whether the council does it or the there's a charter change. So the vote is on whether or not yeah. the council should vote for a council president for two years. Correct. Is that, is that the vote? Or the, 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 we're trying to vote on whether we think it would be better to have a two year president than a one year president, strictly speaking, just based on. I say no. No. Okay. Sherry? No. Um, I, it occurs to me that I did not vote either time, which is very nice. Um, but I was Jim, Jim, you also didn't ask for my vote, and I I'm vote sorry. I, two I, years. I, yes, on two years. Okay. Okay. Me too. Uh, I'm sorry. I said me too. I agree. Okay. Um, I, 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 I am casting a vote. Uh, no on elect direct election. And I will vote uh, yes on the two-year term. Okay. Third and last question that I know of, which is whether or not you recommend this be a that if that if we go to a two-year term, whether you recommend that as a charter change as opposed to doing it through council rule. So yes would be for a charter change. Dylan? No. Jeffrey? Yes. DC? Yes. Marvin? No. Marcella? Yes. David? No. Michael? Okay. Uh, I'm leaning at this point toward a yes, if he, because as Marcella pointed out, both Andrew and Evan came before us, and I believe both of them felt that the term should be longer. And um, they were asking our help as a commission to um, to help implement that um, and get it done, perhaps through a charter change. Um, 
So I could be persuaded, depending on what what input we get from staff and perhaps getting back to the um, to the council as to um, do they want us to recommend it formally in a report <clears throat> and what section or sections need to be changed. Um, but here's, here's, here's what I think will happen. You'll vote today, but after you see how the report is written, if you want to withhold your vote for the final report, the way it's written, you can certainly withhold it and change your vote. Okay. So I'll, I'll vote yes. I'll vote okay. yes. Howard? No. Sherry? No. And I will also vote no. So that we are just so we have the counts. We have one, two, three, four, five. We have six no's on that. Okay. Which is a majority. On the electing of the president, I think it was pretty clear they were all no's. And on two year terms, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We had seven yeses. So we had seven yeses for two years, but six no's for uh, making it a charter change. Thank you. That was fun. Okay. Um, we will now move to the issue of uh, the budget in section 305 of the charter. Um, I'm going a little behind on time, but uh, this would be a chance if anybody feels further discussion is warranted before we have a vote, this would be the time to speak. Yeah, can we discuss it a little bit, please? Or Absolutely. Talk about it or explain more, whatever. All right, Marcelo. Uh, Michael, since it's been your primary okay. topic, I will let you do. We're talking about Section 305. Um, in Section 305, there's um, three paragraphs um, covering different aspects. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, anyway, there's three paragraphs um, covering different aspects of the budgeting process and the council approval. Um, all three parts of it have different vote levels. So, um, to get um, one change, you need a seven vote um, supermajority. All three of the sections require, uh, paragraphs require supermajority. So one, one supermajority level is seven votes. Um, a second is eight votes. Um, and a third is 11 votes. Um, what we're suggesting, Dylan, David and I, and, and um, We've, we've spoken to um, the budget administrator in the county and, and gotten other input. Um, what we're recommending is that the charter be changed to um, retain or maintain a supermajority requirement, but um, equalize, or in other words, rationalize um, the vote levels and make it um, a level of two thirds supermajority. Um, and there's several reasons for this. Um, one is um, there's a sense of consistency in the um, the budget section 305. Um, if it's all a two thirds level vote, um, it, the two thirds percentage will carry forward um, if the uh, number of council members changes. Um, and um, do you want me to continue? Does, so what we're voting oh, on Oh, no, is... that's good. Thank you. Does anybody else have any comments or questions? Just a discussion. I, mean, I, I have mixed feelings uh, about this because uh, uh, I'm concerned about different areas of the county uh, not getting their fair share of uh, services facilities and all the rest and uh, of uh, different parts of the county uh, ganging up, so to speak, on other parts of the county. And I think that having uh, the, uh, the highest possible majority, I believe in should be unanimous uh, because uh, then uh, you would be compelled to sit down with each and every council member, uh, no matter what district or uh, wherever they may live, or so whether they represent the entire county or not, and uh, try to find out uh, what their concerns are, and uh, basically uh, what it would take uh, to get a majority vote and uh, to get a unanimous vote. And if you feel that's reasonable, we'll 
and you go along with it. You're under a ceiling, you have your tax limitations, you have your budget, and of course you have staff. So, uh, but I, 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 I do believe that, uh, I mean, I guess I'm a product of the legislative branch and uh, I really uh, would like to see uh, each individual council member have uh, the greatest degree of, of leverage on the process uh, that's possible for the benefit of their constituents. The council doesn't always or even generally vote on philosophical issues, for land use. Uh, that's, uh, I think, the, the, uh, uh, the heart and soul of uh, what the local government does. So uh, I believe that that's uh, the extent to which uh, the, uh, uh, the members uh, go back home, go back to their districts and say, well, did we get the playground or why is that uh, facility over there and not here? And how come we didn't get this? And well, I was outvoted. And, 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 uh, so, uh, is it? Yeah. so anyway, I, 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 that's kind of the way I, I would like to see uh, the greatest leverage for individual council members on the budget process. Are, are you arguing for a unanimous vote only on the tax part of section 305 or on any other section? Part of section? Other section. Oh, yeah. On all three, on all three of the yeah. voting requirements. Yeah. yeah it's, it's interesting, um, almost a, a philosophical debate, whether um, unanimous votes um, of any body <laughs> Legislative body um, is is more democratic or less democratic? You know, uh, democratic being you know the the, um, the management style, um, and um, I think you, possibly you could be persuaded that if it's um, a supermajority, if we set it in a supermajority, um, which it is now, um, um, and we allow for dissent, public dissent, and um, uh, vote uh, council members to uh, not be pressured, peer pressured into um, having to vote unanimously. Um, and on the other hand, um, uh, they could be hiding behind uh, the vote of un unanimity. Um, if you allow um, descending votes, then um, there's more transparency um, in a board because in, in this um, what we're suggesting is there be an eight member supermajority. Three members would be able to dissent and dissent publicly. Uh, the in this case the tax tax rate would be raised, um, uh, but you would have the, the public would have the benefit of those three members being able to um, voice their opposition in you know public and the eight you know if if um, as we heard from one person testifying, um, they they feel that it might be easier to raise uh, tax rates if it's less than a uh, unanimous vote. Well, I'm, I can be persuaded that it won't be uh, because the eight members voting yes have to be concerned, if you will, about the three members who are, who are opposed to it, or, you know, three or whatever the number is, and um, publicly discussing their position. So there'll be that, that public transparency. So, uh, or, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of a philosophical question whether a, a super majority should be always defined as a, you know, in order to involve everybody in the decision-making process, unanimous, or can it be something less than unanimous vote? Right. I mean, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that, and as you say, I have, I have uh, mixed feelings. I mean, obviously, there are private conversations that can occur between counselors uh, as to uh, uh, what different members want, and there are different parts of the county that contribute differently to the county as a whole. So. Uh, I'd like to see the, each individual council have the leverage. So we did ask this question of the county executive. Look, like, um, the yeah. county executive, we asked, you know, do, does a, the existence of supermajority inhibit the work of the council? 
then does the in, does the existence of you know, a requirement for unanimity inhibit? And in both the council and the president, uh, county executive and the president, um, didn't seem to have a problem with the supermajority requirement, but pointed to unanimity as being the the area which uh, was more problematic um, or was problematic. Um, you know, remember um, Elrich saying, you know, specifically calling that out. Um, and we do know, you know, when we look at other legislative bodies like the Senate, unanimity can be a real hindrance. Like we remember Tuberville not re not too long ago, holding up all um, all appointments to Department of Defense because he had a concern about some something that had nothing really to do with Department of Defense was he had a, a issues on abortion. So unanimity in that case probably robbed uh, the the body of the ability to to serve democracy. Um, you know, eventually that that veto was broken, but that ability to veto all policy because you have something that you want to, you want addressed is probably it, it not is probably it is fundamentally anti-democratic. If if every one person has a veto, then that is not majority rule. That is the opposite of majority rule. That's minority rule. All right. So. Um, I think the, the question we have clearly on the table based on the proposal that Michael has put forward. Well, with Dylan and David. Okay. All right. Uh, it is, uh, I would phrase it this way, which is, should the charter be changed to require a two-thirds vote for all three of the actions that are listed in Section 305 instead of the current voting levels? What I'd like to know now is whether anybody wants to propose either a different form of that question or a, an additional question beyond that question. Seeing no hands raised, we will call that question. Whether or not you propose, we propose to, ch to change the charter to require a two thirds vote for all three of the actions that are currently listed in section 305 um, instead of the current voting levels, which are seven votes, eight votes and unanimous vote. Okay, I'll start with Dylan. Um, yes. Jeffrey? E, yeah, well, I understand the implications politically of getting rid of unanimity. Unanimity. Um, I'm in favor of going to consistency and two thirds for everything. Okay, CC? I am in for and <laughs> I am for consistency with the uh, supermajority vote. And a two thirds. Yes, two thirds. Marcella. I agree, two thirds for everything. Marvin? Yeah, two thirds for all. David? Yes. Michael? Yes. Howard, I just, I, since people are explaining again, I'll just uh, try to make the point uh, a different way. I think local government deals with different issues. I don't think local government is really that comparable to state or national legislative bodies because of the uh, heavy preponderance of uh, land use. And I think that is what uh, distinguishes uh, local government. Uh, so, uh, that's one of them. I believe they should be in it. So I guess I'll vote. Okay. Sherry? Yeah, in, in hearing uh, people come forward in, in the listening sessions, they, to me, expressed a, a clear preference for the charter as written. So my vote is also no. And, and I will vote yes. Okay, that takes us to section 215 and the proposals uh, related to uh, the executive's non appointment to non merit physicians. Um, maybe we have anybody who would like to open up that discussion or to ask questions or further comment. Yeah, I think you, I would suggest um, you need to phrase the question with two parts, probably. 
Yeah, one is, do we go with what the executive would like? In other words, um, he can appoint um, non-merit positions or can uh, fill non-merit positions um, below the, the agency head um, without having to go to the council and um, have some sort of time limit. Okay, so that's one. And then the other um, question is just have a time limit. On the question regarding time limit, can we be really clear as to whether we're talking about all non-merit positions or only those merit positions above a certain level or below a certain level? So I just want to be I, clear. I would say all, all. I would say all. Yeah, that's what Prince George's County, you know, other counties do. I mean, I'm not saying that Montgomery County must be, but that's a good point. Obviously, we have a president in the country and, and a governor in the state, but we've not always had a county executive. And I think, again, this goes uh, to the uniqueness of local government. For centuries, or at least 150 years or something of that nature, uh, the, uh, the county and most counties uh, were governed by uh, boards of commissioners, uh, council members uh, selected in, 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 in different ways. Uh, and the uh, executive function uh, was totally uh, within the uh, legislative branch. And then there was a Charter Review Commission. And I remember it well. I actually remember it well. Because uh, the, the factions in the county, uh, there was a strong feeling uh, on uh, both ways as to whether or not we should have a county executive. Uh, being a charter county, other counties seem to be going in that direction. Uh, cities have mayors and so on and so forth. So uh, there was a, a lot of support for creating the position of county executive. And uh, it went on um, on the ballot. And of course, it, uh, it passed. And guess what? The first county executive was a member of the county council, uh, Jim Gleason. <laughs> member of the council, was elected county executive, and, and then uh, re-elected. In other words, we have a county executive. And if you're going to have an executive, which is obviously what uh, the people wanted and have supported, I think that you have to uh, give the county executive the tools to do the job. And uh, as I say, as a product of the, the legislative branch, uh, I would like to see the legislative branch have the greatest possible authority. Uh, but uh, uh, you, you, uh, you cannot uh, negate the normal functions of an executive, I don't believe, if you have an executive, because why have the executive? Why go to the expense of having an executive branch at all? Uh, and I think that uh, these type of, uh, of appointments are... Uh, well within and should be well within uh, the purview of um, of the executive. And uh, I, I rather think, and, and again, I've seen this transition over, over the years. Uh, uh, we had uh, a member of the council, uh, Neil Potter, who was elected to county executive, and then he was elected to, to the county council and <laughs> back from the went from the council to the executive back to the council and uh, it was perfectly understandable that uh, when he was um, and anyone would be when you're on the council uh, you uh, uh, want to assert the authority of the council when you're an executive you want to assert the, the authority of an executive over appointments and and uh, and all the rest so uh, I uh, I do believe that having an executive that, that this is a, a function that executives generally have and need uh, to have uh, the uh, necessary uh, authority uh, within the executive branch in the presentations to the council and presentations to the public and in simply uh, running uh, the executive branch of the county government. Anybody else? Okay, so let's 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 see how we have these framed. The first question I have framed it would be whether or not um, 
we would support a proposed amendment to the county charter section 215 um, to allow the county executive to make appointments below the agency and department head level without confirmation by the council. That would be the first question. Okay. Uh, the second question would be um, if we do not adopt um, that proposal, whether or not there's, we would support imposing a deadline on the council for confirming all appointments to non-merit positions. Okay. And I, I think there's a third question there, which is if you do impose a deadline, whether that deadline should be pick a number. You've proposed, I know you've proposed 45, 45, 45 days, yeah. but people might think 45 days is the wrong. So we'll take, you know, some sort of informal point. Is, is there an, an option other than 45 days that has some popular support among this group? I'd go with 60. You would go with 60? Mm -hmm. Okay. We could propose it as if you believe, if, if you believe there should be a deadline, whether or not that should be 45 or 60. We have some votes for 45. We have at least one vote for 60. Does anybody else have a, a different option they want to lay on the table? So, Jim, I think that the issue here is not wanting to tie the hands of, or to make things unworkable in the situation where you have, say, a summer recess, something like that, where there's no possibility for them to act. And we have, we're, we're proposing something that would make that make it impossible to implement. So one possible way around that is, um, one way around that would be to tie it to the next meeting of the council. So the council would have to act within 30 days of the next meeting. Um, that way, it's 30 days of that meeting. If that meeting's two weeks away, if that meeting's six weeks away, the next time they meet, they have to discuss it, and then that that would bring to a vote at the a, a month following. I, I don't know if that seems like a reasonable solution to people. Yes. Well, you may still have the summer yeah, yeah. Meeting after right after that meeting, in which case you still have an impossibility. You're right. It doesn't really solve it in that case. Um, but they would have the they would have the opportunity to vote at it. At the meeting right before the summer um, recess, they would be jammed in, in that way, I suppose. Okay, you're yeah. right. I think David, you're right. I think you're very yeah, good point. They, right. If they had sufficient information to make a decision, and if they didn't, then they would be in a bind. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's the issue we we, we heard that that we we don't want to make it impossible for them to to act in a fair, reasonable way. I think. Well, we did. We did ask Marcel um, about um, you know what the average length of time is, and and does um, the winter break um, does uh, does that affect the time frame? And she said, I, I believe ninety or ninety five percent of the time, um, candidates get approved within like a two or three week period. So she did say that, yeah. Yeah. Maybe then the answer is uh, within two. Instead of saying a time limit we say within two council meetings would that be a, a reasonable solution well those could be a week apart yeah so then they're a week apart i mean there aren't council meetings a week apart but theoretically they could call a special one and then that would be a week apart but that's fair they have an opportunity to discuss the issue then they have an opportunity to vote on the issue can can we get jim can we ask staff it, does that seem like a re reasonable my only thing from the clerk's the clerk's office when they schedule the agenda, it's usually ten days in advance for anything's added to the agenda. Um, so, I think you would have to define a deferred account of Keeley on that. But when something comes over from the county executive, it would have to be ten days before the meeting where it was to be introduced, um, just based on when the council president, the clerk, um, meet to determine that agenda. What if, what if you what if you said that whatever number of days you settle on, okay, that, 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 that those number of days would be told during the period of the recess. You can just, just, in other words, so that 
your days, any days during the recess are not counted towards the, whatever the limit, you pick 45, 60, whatever the number of days you choose, you just wouldn't count the days during a recess, that the, the, the running of the period is told during the recess. Would that satisfy you? Yes, I think that is, a, if there's a way to word that, that becomes a good solution. Okay, we'll work on the wording when, when we draft, but. So it's like work days, you know, not like if you don't include the weekends. I mean, it's just. Yeah. Okay, so let's see if we could rephrase this question so people are clear on what they're voting on. After we vote on whether or not there should be a deadline, um, the question will be framed as if there is a deadline, whether it should be um, 45 days. In, in session days or something like that. 45 days. Um, so this is quite, it's getting complicated. Do we still have, do we have people who want to propose 60 or is that off the table? I forgot. Can okay. I mention something with regard to the 60? Uh -huh. The 60 um, is already in place with regard to regulations. So in terms of the clerk's office systems, there is, a, when, when regulations come in from the uh, county executive, there are some regulations which if they're not acted upon within 60 days, they take effect. And so that's just, I'm just throwing that out there as um, in terms of internal systems with the clerk's office, there's already a mechanism for that, for automatic approval of certain things that don't get acted on within 60 days. So all I'm saying is that 45 will be a departure from an existing system. And go I'm, consistently. Saying, I'm, saying, I'm saying you're saying that if it doesn't get approved or they don't act within that time, the the appointee gets automatically approved. No, this is regulations. This is not candidates. No, but I'm for just I... an, an analogy to regulations, when the CE, when the county executive oh, sends right. regulations, um, there are certain types of regulations that would automatically get approved be deemed approved if they were not acted upon within 60 days. So they get approved, not rejected, and they don't have to start all over again. They get approved. Okay. Thank you. So perhaps 60 days does solve our problem if the experience of the council is that 60 days is that sort of reasonable sweet start spot um, in these exceptional con conditions that we're currently considering. If they've already kind of figured out that that works for regulations, perhaps that becomes the sweet spot for the appointments as well. Um, how about if we do this? Why don't we vote on why don't we vote on whether it should be forty five or sixty, and then we can decide after the outcome of that vote whether there's a majority who would also want to vote on an option to toll that period. Because if if sixty prevails, there may be nobody who wants to toll it during the recess. And if 45 prevails, there may be a lot of people who want to toll the term. Want to do that? Okay. I'm seeing hands shaking. Okay. okay. You already voted on the first question. We're going to we're going to go back to the first question, the original question. The first question is whether or not we propose as a charter amendment um, that non-merit appointments below the agency head level be allowed to be appointed by the county executive um, without confirmation by the council. Let's start with Dylan. Yes. Jeffrey? No. CC? No. Marvin? Yes. Marcella? Marcella, you're on mute, so we didn't hear you. I apologize. Yes. David? David, you're on mute. I vote no. Michael? Uh, yes. Howard? Yes. Jerry? No. And, and I vote no as well. We have one, two, three, four. We have a tie. <laughs> okay. So we have 11 feet. You know what happens. You report a tie. I mean, if this was a legislative body, you know what would happen. It would be defeated. But a tie is a tie, and we'll report it that way. So, 
unless somebody changes their vote after they read it in writing after the draft. So, but then, okay. Can I vote no twice? <laughs> Oh, that's but funny. If, I wrote it down that way. Yeah, I just wanted to know that's an odd number on the council. <laughs> if there are 11 people on the commission, how can well, there be a tie? We have a Did not everybody vacancy vote? on the council. We have a vacancy. Oh, uh, excuse me. I apologize. You're right. Okay. All right. Um, that question being, could we reconsider and then maybe to uh, maybe someone could be persuaded? Well, I think I think that after we have a draft, people may read the draft and decide that they like the way the arguments went. I mean, I just I wouldn't I wouldn't expect they've changed their mind in the last thirty seconds, unless somebody here is jumping out of their seat. Um, for, for the non for the non merits of with it, the next proposal on the table is whether or not um, we would we would approve a recommended charter change. Um, that all non-merit appointments um, have a deadline for the council too. And I'll be real clear about this because I think it's worth noting. They would, there would be a time deadline for the council to act either to confirm, reject, or defer the appointment. Now that's, a, that's, that's how I read it. That's how I understood it. If people have a different understanding that now is the time to speak up. Well, the if, they, if they have the authority they have the ability to defer, then they have the ability just to string it out even more. Well, that's I think that's the rub. I think that's that's why we need to clarify. If, if, if people intend yeah. not to, to allow that, then we have to be very specific about what we're recommending. That's why I raised it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, just looking at other counties, for example, Frederick County, it's very simple. In other words, um, the county fails to take action within, in this case, it's 30 days. Um, the appointment by the executive, the appointment shall become effective. Right. And I think I think the question is, and there are several other. I think we're talking about when we say they have thirty days to take action or forty five days to take action. Right. Whether take action means any action, whether it means only approve, or whether it means approve, reject, defer. So I would propose taking out the word defer, then not giving them the option to defer. I would agree. Well, well, I have a question about that. If anyone knows, is how how does that look like in real in real life? Like, uh, would they would there be a discussion and then a deferment, or or just because they don't have time, they can just say we we are we are tabling that for next meeting because an action is an action, and there could be a, a valid reason as to why they are deferring that maybe they need more information or whatever, and that's valid because it. Uh, it's good enough for me that they they discuss that and they they uh, review the uh, whatever it is on the table. So I think the firm is good if there is a discussion. Well, well, I think as a practical matter, if you tell somebody they must either accept or reject in, in, a, in a certain period, and they're not ready to do that, they they have no choice but to reject. They're going, we want more time to investigate. And you told me I can only accept or reject, and I I'm not comfortable. But I just reject, right? Yeah, but on the other hand, the executive is running the county. And, you know, this might be a position that he really needs to get filled. And then, you withdraw. then I guess you withdraw and you put up somebody else. Right. right. And and that's the point that the, the executive made when he spoke with us, that sometimes he feels that he can do his job because it takes a long time. Okay, so... I forget whose proposal this was originally. You, this you were further defining. I just I, so it's a question. We want to agree on how the phrase. Even if you want, if you want to separate it into two separate questions, we can have two separate questions. Just so we're clear on what question we're voting on first. Okay. Um, I think the the wording as it's stated. Um, makes it simpler. In other words, um, just to change. Um, if the county fails to take action within 60 days um, by the appointment of the executive, the appointment becomes effective or something like that. Baltimore County has something similar, Anne Arundel. 
So there's ample precedent uh, for this in Maryland. Well, I, I guess the, the, in that case, right, the way you're reading, the way you're reading it, in that case, the words take action mean reject. If the county fails to reject within that period of time, then it then it takes effect. I mean, that's that's what take action means there. Right. So you're reading. It. So then I would suggest we phrase it in, a, in that very clear way so there's no ambiguity. All right. So we could frame the question that way, leaving open that you want. If the question is, should the charter be amended so that if the council fails to take action to reject within some specified number of days, right, the appointment becomes effective. We'll vote on the number of days, but is that the way folks want to phrase the question at this point? Seems clear. To yes. Me. I'm okay that with that. Seems clear. Okay. So that's how it'll be phrased. We'll call the question as whether we propose to, whether we approve or a proposed amendment to the charter that would require that would state that if the council fails to take action to reject a non-merit appointment within a specified number of days, the appointment shall become effective. Okay, we'll take that vote. Dylan? Yes. Jeffrey? Yes. PC? Yes. Marvin? Yes. Marcella? Yes. David? Yes. Michael? Yes. Howard? Yes. Sherry? Yes. And the chair will vote no on that, actually. Okay. The next question is, um, if there, if the charter is amendment to create a deadline for the council to act, um, to reject whether that deadline should be forty-five days or uh, sixty days, does anybody want to change that question to frame that way? We'll have a separate question afterwards on dealing with tolling it. But are people comfortable with framing it as forty-five or sixty? Yes. Yes. Okay. Frame that way, uh, voting for 45 or 60. We'll start with Dylan. 60. Jeffrey? 60. Cece? Well, hell, I was going to be a 45, but I don't want to be a <laughs> oddball here. Let me vote last, <laughs> see where the room is. <laughs> so what are, you, what are you voting for? Uh, let me vote last. I'll see where the room is. Oh, you can't vote last. The chair always votes last, but go ahead. Well, I mean, next to the last. <laughs> Marvin? Uh, 60. Marcella? 45. David? You're muted, David. I vote 60. Michael? Uh, 60. 60 is fine. Howie? 45. Sherry? 60. Coming back to Cece. 45. I heard 45, but it was, it was a little muffled. I just want to be clear. 45? 45, yes. And the, and the, since I voted for no time deadline, I'm not going to vote for 45 or 60. I'll just abstain on that one. Okay. Maybe you'll have a change of heart as you think about it. Maybe. 60 is a long time. Yeah, that's what I thought too. If um well, I, I tell you what changed. I'll, I'll be honest with you. What changed what what may have pushed me towards say no was that um that there's no deferral option. The way that we framed it is it's to reject only. So I, that, that did it for me. Okay. Um do you, do, since we have so many 60s, I think the question is whether we still want to phrase a third question as whether or not the period should be told during recess. Maybe I think just... if I could, just, discussing that 60 days, that in essence, then the council could just decide not to vote 
if they don't have any firm opposition, they could just not even put it on the agenda and just let the time toll. Sure. But it would be, it, but it would be approved, right? It's, 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 it would be an approval after that period of time. Yeah, it's the opposite of a pocket veto. You just don't. Right, right. A pocket approval. Pocket approval, exactly. Yeah. All right. Um, do we have people who still want to go to the tolling during recess? No. And I'm going to ask the people who are or the voters for 45. Do you want to say it's CC, Marcella, and, and Howie who said they prefer it to be 45? Do you favor tolling it during recess? I really don't want to micromanage this decision, so I'm going to defer. <laughs> Uh, that means you you don't you don't want to call the question. Is that what you're saying? Yep, exactly. Okay. Uh, Marcella. Do, Marcella, do you wanna, you're on mute. Do you want to? Yeah, you're on mute. I'm sorry. You're still on mute. Sorry. Hey. Okay. I don't understand what you're asking. Sorry. Okay. The, the question is, is whether or not you want to take, whether you're in favor of opposing as a separate question to take a vote on, tolling the 45-day period that you favor um, during council recess. No. No. Okay. Howard? Yes, for whom the bell tolls. Huh? You, you would like to? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Uh, any, and I guess the question is, does anybody else favor posing that question? Because if we only have one person who wants to, to raise it, if you, if you want to raise it, I'm going to raise it. But does anybody else want to raise the question of polling? Okay. It appears we don't have uh, enough folks who want to raise that question. So we will drop that question. Well, by my accounts, that is the last question we had to vote on. Does anybody have anything they want to vote on other than that? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, that, that brings us to our agenda item for planning the drafting of this report. Um, I circulated the document that I didn't draft until late last night. I'm not sure why I didn't think of it earlier, but it's, it's sort of a draft possible outline of how the report would look from a table of contents standpoint. So because it's table of contents, it's at a relatively high level. Um, I don't presume anybody had a chance to look at it in advance because it was very late when I sent it around, but um, it is something to consider. Um, I, I guess the question now is um, we need to sort of get our ducks in a row. I, I've circulated at the last two meetings, a proposed schedule for the drafting process that would take us all the way until April 24th, which is pretty late in the game since it's the report is due by law by April 30th. Um, have folks had a chance to look at that schedule? Um, and, and I guess we'll take now comments on the schedule as to whether or not people think it needs to be adjusted or whether the schedule seems to work. Okay, I, ha I have a question. Drafting a document, well, first of all, they're in preparing the reports, you know, right. last year and, and early this year. There's significant amount written about a couple of these issues. Um, so oh, we, we have a head start. We do have, have a head start. Head start. Okay. Um, how, how do you envision the writing process going? Is, I'll you, tell you this. Okay. And, 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 and how much is staff going to be in? Staff, I don't expect staff to do any, but they can, they can chime in now if they want to. Um, yeah, we'll do like formatting and everything for like the print production and obviously give it a read through to see any like, so, I don't want to use the word egregious errors, but if we catch something that like, that's fine, but that's. Okay, will, will you do editing and proofreading? I, I'm not. I think if, so, if something really pops out quickly, yes, but I, we wouldn't call through it. To, to do it so, so. I, I will share you with you just my personal experience because I am. Fortunately, unfortunately, I'm not sure yet. Um, I, I had a job where we just basically had to draft two and 300 page documents with, you know, sometimes four or five people, sometimes six or eight people. Um, 
somebody has to be the project lead. You know, what we used to do is we used to just assign sections, right? You draft that section, you draft this section, you draft this section. Um, they all come together. They all get sent to one party whose job it is to compile them and to fill in gaps where necessary um, and basically act as a, as a lead editor. And then that document gets circulated to everybody um, to review. And then you just take comments from everybody. But it, it, you know, it does help to have people who are experts in particular subjects. And in this case, the people who led the work groups draft their section because they know the topic the, the best. Um, but in, in an open process, everybody gets a chance to, to comment and say, well, you left this out or you left that out, or I wish you hadn't phrased it this way or that way, so. Okay, that raises the question about this open meetings requirement. If you recall, one of the reasons why we had to go to the smaller subcommittees is we could do the working process without having the open meeting. I wouldn't envision that being a problem because I wouldn't envision any meeting where we have six people all talking through a draft. It would be- Okay, but how do we circulate the draft? So documents, so- Can I just speak on the last, the last time they did this? Everybody reviewed the draft, sent the comments into the chair. At that final meeting, the chair went through any changes that right. were brought up, and they were, I don't think they were, like, poll voted on, but just yeah. or nay. Yeah. Okay, but the comments went only to the chair, sure. not to... Well, not to in, the, in theory, they go to the, whoever it is whose job it is to put all the pieces together. You have to have somebody put all the pieces together into one draft and accept comments. And, you know, frankly, I mean, look, when you're accepting comments from whether it's five, six, or 20 people... There's always this sifting of comments and deciding which ones you're going to take and which ones you're not, and you don't make everybody happy. It's not the fun part of the job, but you do have to do it, and then ultimately, you have to get everybody to agree to the document. But but um, I, I did anticipate uh, taking that on as the chair of staff to to receive the drafts and assemble them into one document and do the job I I've made somebody else do when I was in my career, which is you do that. I'm not doing that. But but. Uh, I think in this section, I, I sort of have to step up and do it. And the report is due to the council no later than May 1st. Yeah, I've been using April 30th as my deadline, but but this schedule I had would, would you know, I, I really think we had to, I had to do it around the ability to have this group meet um, and meet far enough before that April 30th deadline so that you could put finishing touches on anything the group decided at the last meeting and still give staff time to do whatever formatting or production they needed to do to get it to the council on time. So that's why the last date was April 24th. I move approval of the um, schedule as proposed. I'll Thank second you. it. It's April 10th and April 24th. Right, our meetings would be April 10th and April 24th. Eight o'clock for here. Eight o'clock for here. I didn't want to upset anybody's traditional schedules. <laughs> All right, unless I hear an opposition or a suggestion for a change, not hearing that, we'll consider the schedule adopted by unanimous consent. And now um, we're looking for volunteers um, on the assignments for drafting, taking the primary drafting responsibility. And I think for each person who has primary drafting responsibility for the three, for one of the three issues, you're certainly welcome to um, you, if there's time to collaborate with your your smaller work groups, if that's how you all want to do it. I mean, at some point, too many cooks, you know, makes it harder, but uh, I leave it to the all discretion on how you want to actually get your section draft. Do I have a volunteer for being the lead drafter on the council presidency issue? Okay. Sherry, that's so kind of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Who volunteer? I couldn't see. Right. It's me. I can't see. I'm sorry. Sherry. Oh, Sherry. Oh, Sherry. Thank you, Sherry. Okay. Uh, do I have a volunteer for lead drafting on the Section 305 budget issue? Um, no, I'll do I'm that. Gonna... Yeah. Okay, Dylan. Dylan. Dylan is volunteer. Thank you very much, Dylan. But David and Michael, I'm going to do it as a collective. Um, and I do have a question. Sure. About what needs to be in there. In the agenda, it talks about summary of public input, but in the chapter headings or the, the draft table of content, that is not mentioned. I don't I have any. So, I am so glad you raised that. Well, it's in um, section four. 
So, so here's what I did. I, I really tried to, and I was, it really was very late last night when I did this. Um, you can check the timestamp on the email. You can check that out. Um, these were really meant to be table of contents, very high level description, you know, very high level uh, table of contents type descriptions. Um, I just didn't think we would ever go into that level of detail in a table of contents. However, you're right. If you look at the agenda, I, I, I did list some suggestions for how to give, how to give, you know, substance to the headings that are basically when you're when you're summarizing the issue and discussing the pros and cons, the they on the agenda you'll see some bullet points of what you know what hopefully will go into those discussions of substance and pros and cons. I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm not trying to control this in that and to, to that nth degree, but I thought these were things that sort of jumped out at me in terms of you know. What what is what is, what did you find in your research? What did you what did we consider as options? What were the things we talked about? The options and up the options we considered. So um, the question uh, is: Are there notes or transcripts or anything from the listening session that could be used to form the basis of this summary of public opinion? Yeah, I mean, all of our you know we do have our minutes, but our minutes don't generally go into that level of detail. We do have. Every meeting we've had, including the listings, they're all recorded and available online, right? Every single meeting, right? Uh, they are all recorded and they're available on the uh, Charter Review Commission's website. Uh, and uh, because people would have been directed to also send things by email, we've been monitoring the email. And as of yesterday or this morning, there's nothing. Yeah, it's six, six o'clock yesterday. There's nothing. So everything that has so far been submitted was passed along to the commission and there's nothing new since. Okay. So what I would ask then, um, in order to facilitate the drafting of all the different people's sections, would be that somebody uh, from staff send an email with three things in it. First thing being the final report to the commission itself that we did a couple of months ago, laying out the issues. The second thing being a link to those notes on the commission website. Um, and the third thing being the schedule as agreed. If so, somebody would be so kind as to compile those three things into one email and send that to the entire commission, that would be really helpful. Because then I, when I start my drafting, I have those three things in front of me and um, I don't have to go look for, you know, here. And I, I, hopefully that's not too onerous. Thank you. Okay. Um... And, and this is the hard one. I thought about this um, in the section that talks about, you know, our recommendation. I, I think you're going to have to do this sort of by feel, but um, there are a lot, there are 10 of us here. And even on things where we're unanimous, we, not, we, we may not be unanimous in our rationale or our thinking for why we voted for something. Um, and so I think when you get, you, you know, that people say, I want to see what the pros were. I want to see what the cons were. The, 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 the folks who read the report will want to see, you know, what went into the decision. And then the harder thing is whether or not you say, you know, and our conclusion was we voted this way. Um, it's the because, like we voted this way because. That, I think, becomes very hard um, to summarize the because if you don't have agreement among all 10 of us. And so that's where I think you want to use a little discretion on whether it's necessary to go beyond pros and cons and then to the recommendation, whether or not you want to draw that link in such a way as to start picking off your fellow members who voted with you. Um, you know, if, if we were really unanimous on the because, that will show up. But I think the more specific you tried to be as to your reasoning for why you went yes or no, um, you're going to start to have trouble losing people as to whether they really agree with your vote. And so I just be wary of that in drafting. Um, and, and maybe the, you know, a better thing to do is, is to be less definitive as to the reasoning why you chose to vote a certain way and just leave the public to read the pros and the cons and the, and the ultimate result. But, um, well, Jim, but, Jim, are we allowed to, by the, the, the um, open meetings law, are we allowed to kind of consult with individual commission members? Absolutely. Okay. As long as you don't have more than five people, actually, Five, I guess five is technically a problem, right? Is five a problem in a group of 10? 
It's not. Well, it, here the our quorum is six. Because six. Okay. So as long as you have five or fewer people in the discussion group, you're fine. And I, okay. And we all of our working groups were less than five, as I recall, right. for that reason. Then, yeah. Exactly. So, so how, how would I would like to um, make sure that I consult with you about your your specific points on a, a position? I'll I'll send you my draft to make sure I'm capturing it accurately. I mean, I think your your comments as a former council member were valuable, interesting, and we do want to make sure they get captured in the report. Okay, thank you. Well, right. that uh, raises another issue. There's a primary drafter for the section, but there's a section called, or a subsection there, minority view. Well, I, I was going to get to that, but let me let me first get volunteers for the not for the drafting of the section three on non-merit appointments. We, do we have any volunteers who want to take the draft? Yeah, I'll, I'll continue with that. And it, if, if you'd like to, uh, Howard, uh, and perhaps others, to work with you on that. Yeah. So that that takes us to uh, David's question, which is, there was the option for a, a group of folks who voted against the majority position to draft a minority position. That is strictly optional, and it's up to the people who voted that way. Um, not you could either there's just two ways. I could you could have a minority position represented in the report. Or you could have individuals who just want to speak their mind and speak only for themselves. That's sort of optional, um, and you're welcome to you're welcome to express that sentiment here. Do it on your own, gang up with each other, and do it any way you like. I don't I don't know whether we have it. I I think I probably it's the lone dissenter on the uh, on the time deadline. I will probably I probably will write something reflecting my own view. Um, I don't. I don't plan to lobby people to join me. I just that's just something I feel I should do. You know, are there examples in the previous? There are. There are. There are minority reports in the in the prior years reports. There there have been minority reports, um, and and there was an issue. They split uh, five to five. I'm trying to remember on what it was. It was something fairly significant. They split five to five on. Um, And they had they had the same problem as they had a vacancy, um, so when it's a five to five split, it's, yeah, I think it's I think there's there's a definite public benefit to seeing both sides when it's five to five. But I trust that they can be drafted. The pros and cons can be drafted that way before it gets to the point where right, it's really not so much a minority report. It's just that is the report, right? That we had two views and split even. <laughs> Okay, um, and, and and if there are further discussions or questions people want to have about the drafting, you know, feel free to call me. Um, feel free to call each other. Just don't get more than five of you on the phone. That's all. In the room. <laughs> um, anybody else want to have anything else they want to raise at this time? Okay. Um, just for sake, I, I've had this conversation with staff, but just so that everybody else is clear. Um, can we get staff to just sort of tell folks how all of these submissions that the public have given us will be available if they're, if they're not already available? They might already. How uh, anybody who's drafting, anybody who wants to read either the public comment letters or the um, written testimony that was submitted on March 6th, is there an easy way? It will be the link you send them. Yes, all the public testimony is up on the website, okay. the same place where you where you can access minutes, agendas. We also will have the testimony posted up there. That's right. right? The videos, not the actual written. Not the written testimony. It's okay. To check on what, and if we can post that. Um, yeah, I believe we can, but um, we certainly have already circulated it to the commissioners, and um, we'll look into whether it can be posted. I believe it can. It's it was submitted as public testimony, so it should be part of the record. It was submitted via email. I just have to check because I know it's different than than how they submit public testimony for like bills and stuff like that. Uh, to the well, I know they were handing it to us some paper, and I didn't I didn't ask at the time. But I mean, like a couple of these people they were literally handing me paper, and I didn't know if you had it in literature on a copy or not. 
Uh, the one I, I recall at the listening session, one person brought a paper copy, but they had emailed it as okay. well. So uh, the email that was sent to all commissioners was all the written testimony that there was. Yeah. And the letters, the comment letters, I mean, a couple of months ago, you circulated by email the first couple letters we received. I don't know right. if the final letter received is everybody. Better. I'll go back through everything. I'll resend everything in one email. It'll include all the emails that we've received, which I think is either six or seven, and the written testimony from uh, people on the listening sessions. I'll send that out with the links um, that, as Dylan requested, and um, the schedule, the three the three points that um, Dylan had brought up before. I'll send it all in one email. So that Thank you. Everybody, yeah. Could I ask, is the listening session just an audio recording or is it a transcription? It's a video recording. It's a video. Oh, that's fine. So it's not transcribed is what I guess is. Are we able to pull out the website? I have the transcribed Zoom. Um, they automatically transcribe it. I can send it to you. I can't promise how accurate the Zoom AI transcribing is, but I can send that out. Thank you. And with the chair's permission, can I just circle back to the question in section one? Sure. Earlier in the meeting, there was a question about uh, which section would be amended if we we're looking at um, two year term. The two year term. Yeah. So I just wanted to confirm it is section 108 of the charter, and the first line reads The council shall elect from among its members a president of the council who shall preside over meetings of the council. It does not say anything about um, you know number of years or no, any it, of that. Now, in the council rules of procedure, there is a further provision there. Um, the council rules of procedure rule one G provides for election of council members uh, of council officers, and it says the council elects a council president, a council vice president, and other officers as council desires. At, first, at the first council meeting each December. That is in the rules of procedure, which is an appendix to the code. The rules of procedure online? They are. Okay. They are the online version of the code has an appendix and the rules of procedure are an appendix to that. Okay. I believe we do have something, someone on the uh, Zoom from the Office of the County Attorney. So if if they wish to chime in, Lisa Brennan Zoom, Zoom as well from OCA. I'm sorry. The question is whether or not the appendix to the code is available. I, I missed the final question. No, the, the appendix is available online. The, I was addressing the question uh, raised earlier in the meeting about which section would need to be amended if they were doing the council president change as a charter amendment. And I believe it's section 108. I can look at that, but I, I think you raise an interesting point that it currently doesn't say anything about the term in the charter, which the term is in the council rules. So is the, is the desire to actually add it to the charter? Well, that was that was we that was discussed the question we discussed and voted on. So yeah, that was the proposal some people voted for. Yes. Okay. Um, I can certainly look into what charter provision that would be. Um, I, I'd like to just discuss that with my fellow principal counsel before I get back to you. Can I do that? Sure. After sure. the meeting. Okay. All right. We are, uh, I, I, before we adjourn, can we talk just briefly about um, the next meeting and perhaps some meeting after that? Um, it would be good, I, I think, judging from past commissions, reading about the, the issue with the council members, um, there being a disconnect between the commission and the council. Um, is there a possibility we can invite um, Andrew or perhaps someone else from the council? to attend our April 10th meeting or the meeting after to get some feedback as to what their reaction is to the actions we're taking. I'll tell you what I do. Well, um, well no, I think, I, think, I think we're gonna need, a, you know, I think we're gonna need most of our time to 
work through any issues we have with the draft. But I, I, I have no objection to reaching out to Andrew uh, and or Andrew's chief of staff and saying that there was some interest in it, this that's sort of it's, it's a last opportunity. This is where we, you know, telling them this is where we voted. This is what we're drafting. Um, if you would like the opportunity to address us before we finalize that, that's an option. I, I'm not going to. You know, yeah, I don't think it's going to change anything we're doing. I don't. Uh, think I think it's... knowing that he that may that may influence his desire to put his thumb on the scale. Anyway. Right. Right. And. Um, but I, I I'm glad to present it to him as an opportunity, an opportunity he may or may not choose to avail himself. Of. Okay, can we, can we have a brief discussion? A brief discussion. If, if are, are folks happy or unhappy with that prospect? Has that been done before, Jim? I don't personally know. I doubt it, but I just don't know if our staff knows. I, I'm inclined not to bring the politicians in at this point. We're drafting a report to them. They'll all get it equally. Uh, I'd rather not put them on the spot. And uh, uh, I'd probably much sure I'd be comfortable uh, a asking that or if I were on the other side and, and attending. I mean, frankly, if I, if I, if I, if I, if I said to him, you know, we voted this way or that way, and he says, oh, God, that's an awful vote. Please exactly. don't do that. I couldn't represent to him that I would come back here and ask you all to change your vote. I wouldn't ask you all to change your personal votes. Just because he said so, I wouldn't do that. So I wouldn't pressure you that way, no. Well, Michael, is, is the value of getting clarifi further clarification from him on, on where he would like this to go? Or Yeah, I, I guess I, I'm thinking at, at the um, perhaps after we draft the report, um, rather than just handing it to him, I think there would be I, I personally, I I I think you know, I, I, looking at the future too, you know, the next few years. So I I will tell you, I have a working with relationship with them. That they, when Andrew was here, he offered to be involved, and um, not necessarily changing what we're doing, but at least you know get a you know one on one with. Them. I, I think know. I shared this at our last meeting that I did give him um, our press release before the hearing. So that he was aware of the issues we were bringing forth to the hearing, and he called, chose to call me and and have a discussion with me about it. And he was comfortable with the issues we put on our press release and the way we had framed them. And that I said, "Is there anything here you that strongly bothers you that you wish we wouldn't do?" He said, "No, you're." He said, "I don't agree with it all." He said, "But it's these are all fair questions for the public, and they're fair questions to ask." And he, he said, uh, "Wouldn't necessarily be his personal preference, but he was fine with it, everything." Okay. Well. To me, again, you know, we want to be as productive as we possibly can, and so it sounds like we're still on the same. We're on the right track. I, I, I was comfortable with it. He was comfortable with it. So. Okay. No caller. Okay. So, um, we are at our, and I want to be considered. We are exactly at nine thirty. Man, we are right on. It's amazing. You keep our feet in the front. That's great. All right. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? One final, uh, one final question, if sure. I may. Uh, in section four <laughs> of the your table of contents, it says a summary of feedback from the listening sessions. We obviously cannot print the video. Unknown caller. Uh, so I'm going to volunteer to review the transcription. And uh, if there color. are errors in it, oh, uh, so I will tell you what I. You'll notice in the appendices, it lists yeah. that there will be a link to the video, so the public will be given a link if they want to see the video. Um, frankly, I took that right out of one of our old reports, and in and I think it was probably the most recent old Don't report color. where um, the commission chose to to use that section to. Um, inform folks um, of the level of participation um, to let people know that we had we had two public hearings and only three people appeared um, and in a very cursory fashion referenced um, you know their viewpoints is that they were generally opposed or generally favored and not try to you know we, if we're attaching the three pieces of testimony they submitted I don't see a a, a real significant reason why we need to 
take what was basically a two page testimony and try to distill it. I mean, it just seems like you're putting words in people's mouths. It, it sort of speaks for itself that you've attached their two page testimony. Yeah, that is what happened at page 831. Very interesting to read. So that, that's what I had in mind. Okay. All right. A motion to adjourn. Did I hear one? So, so moved. So moved. Second, somebody. Second. Okay. No objections. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Some extra copies. This is the easiest.